What's up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls around the world? I would like to welcome you back to another episode of the Real Talk with Zuby podcast. Now, on today's episode, we've got on a very interesting lady, a whole lot of she's had a, a crazy past year. We're going to get into all of that. But uh, I would like to welcome Maya Forstater to the show. How are you doing? Um, I'm reasonably OK. I'm not too stressed. Reasonably OK. OK, that's a uh, that's a very in, that's the, a little in, bit the, in the circumstances for this yeah. week. I understand. I understand. Well, what have you got that's coming up this week? We'll get into this. But what have you got that you're feeling some trepidation around? So um, uh, next week is the Employment Appeal Tribunal uh, for my case. People might remember me if they've heard of me at all, uh, because J.K. Rowling tweeted about me in December 2019, where she said, um, force women out of, out of their jobs for saying that sex is real, and I stand with Maya. That was when I lost my Employment Tribunal case, and 18 months later, it's coming up for it appeal okay um so there's a there's a whole lot to get into there yeah but before we dig into that why don't you just introduce yourself to people who don't know of you and give a little bit about your background and who you are and what you do um i'm a researcher i worked for an international development think tank i worked on um i worked on international tax uh, and before that on business and sustainable development uh, supply chain, labor standards, all kinds of things about um, markets and sustainable development. Um, so I'm not, as some people think, an accountant. I never have been an accountant. That's the one. Uh, that's the one thing that people get wrong. Um, and uh, I'm born in born in London. Uh, grew up in London. Lived. Uh, I've lived in Kenya. I've lived in uh, Oklahoma, uh, and in 2018, I was working for an international development think tank uh, in London um, called the Centre for Global Development. And that's where uh, kind of trouble started, which was when I was started tweeting about sex and gender, mm -hmm. um, which led to me losing my job. Wow. OK, so I know what happened here, but for people who are not familiar from your own perspective, of course, as the person who's been directly involved with it what's the what's the story that led up to that what what actually happened so in um 2017 2018 um the uk government was consulting on whether to reform the gender recognition act uh, which is the law in the uk that allows people to change their legal sex uh, and it was originally developed as a law that would allow a very small number of people with a diagnosis of gender dysphoria to change their legal sex with the assumption that that would mean somebody who's um, decided after a long period of time that they, you know, the only way that they can live happily and live a good life is to go through um, a surgical transition and that in order for society to accommodate those very small number of people, it would allow them to change their legal sex. Um, this was brought in in, in 2004. In 2017, the government was saying we should allow people to change their legal sex by an act of uh, self-declaration, self-identity, and women were starting to say, hold on a second, what does that mean? And we were told, it's just it's just admin, nothing's really going to change. Um, but the numbers of people who would, who would be covered by that legislation would have gone up by estimated 100 times and questions about what that would mean for women's sports, women's refuges, um, women's prisons, and generally the ability to talk about material reality were, you know, you're not allowed to talk about that. Um, and so as a researcher, somebody working in a think tank, I thought I should be able to talk about this. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, after having sort of read and followed the debate for about a year, I decided to, that I should use my voice um, because I could see that there were women, mainly women, who were speaking about this and who were getting attacked, um, you know, vilified, physically attacked, uh, and, and people who were scared to speak out. And I thought, well, I work at Think Tank. I work at a place that is a 
is a institu institution of ideas of disagreement um so i didn't think that i was in a vulnerable position i thought that was my job is to is to bring evidence and argument to important public debates and so i tweeted about it uh and before too long um there were sort of alarm bells ringing at the headquarters of the organization that I was working for in Washington, D.C. Uh, and uh, yeah, sort of the long and the short of it was that I lost my job for tweeting about a government consultation. What is it that you tweeted? Um, so initially I tweeted, um, it took me, I mean, it took me ages to write the very first tweet because I knew that this was a difficult topic to talk about. Mm -hmm. And the first tweets that I wrote were the most boring tweets that I've ever written. It was sort of, this is a government consultation, read, read this paper and, you know, have your say or something. It was like, it was, you know, trying to be as um, careful and neutral as possible, you know, really just saying, people should make up their own mind about this and think about it. Mm -hmm. um, and then that got no response. And so then I, I tweeted a bit about things that were going on in the news. So I tweeted about um, Karen White, who is a, was, is a male prisoner who identifies as a woman who was placed in, the, in a women's prison um, and who went on to sexually assault female prisoners and you know that was in the news and I thought that was um you know uh, a scandal yeah, and a, you know a scandal that, that happened and a scandal mm -hmm. that the policy allowed it so I tweeted that nothing um and after you know kind of a few tries of getting people to to engage with this issue I thought I'd ask a direct question so my followers on Twitter at the time, I had about 2,000 followers, and they were mainly international development um, wonks, you know, researchers. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them have made this pledge not to be on a manal. So if a, uh, if a guy is asked to speak at a conference and it's an all-male panel, he will say to the conference organiser nicely beforehand, um, could you find a woman and I'd be happy to step down or you could make the panel bigger. You know, it's a way of getting conference organizers to think, hold on a second, you know, why don't we have any women here? Mm -hmm. um, and so I asked uh, at the time, there was a story in the newspaper about um, a man called Philip Bunce who worked for Credit Suisse, the, um, the bank, big international bank, um, and has an alter ego called Pips Bunce. So uh, he familiar. comes, uh, yeah, so person. he's a he's a husband and father, um, enjoys wearing dresses and wigs and makeup and comes to work on a Friday uh, in his alter ego um, and had been given an award for a woman in business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. That, that, that's, yeah, that's one response anyway. <laughs> You know, you you are talking to the British women's deadlift record holder here. So yes, I can exactly. Totally he did, he he did, he did one of those. Um, <laughs> but they took, you know, they take it absolutely seriously, and he's yeah. he's been fated and given awards, and um, and so I asked my followers if they were asked to be on a on a panel, and it was with two other guys and Pips Bunce, would they say you need to get a you need to get a woman? Mm -hmm. Um, and I was. I was really surprised. So I did get responses because it was a direct question. It was about something that people would have to, it was about a personal decision people would have to make. You know, they mm -hmm. didn't, they couldn't just say, oh, well, that's prison policy or that's sport. That's somebody else's job. They had to think about it and, and they did think about it. And so then there was sort of about 200 tweets over a weekend of people saying, um, well, if he feels like he's a woman, Part of, part of the week, then who are you to say he isn't? And, and isn't that misgendering uh, they're doing right there? Well, probably. I mean, I, I may be, I may be misquoting them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But uh, you know, who are you to say that this person isn't a woman if they say that they're a woman on a Friday? Uh, and you know, I, I was quite surprised and shocked at that. And then <laughs> a few days later, I got an email from uh, HR saying, um, "Please don't." Or we 
ask our staff and associates not to use exclusionary language. Please put a disclaimer on your tweets, as in all views my own, which okay, I yeah, did, yeah. which I said I would, and yeah. I did. Um, but I also said, I would, you know, this is an important policy discussion. I will continue talking about it. I understand that some people will think it's offensive to say that a man is not a woman, but it's true. Um, definitions are exclusionary. And so I, and, and, and I worked at a place that I thought it was a place for robust discussion, mm-hmm. uh, but apparently not on this, on this one topic. And did, so then- j- Just to jump in there, did they mm-hmm. specifically, were they specific about what they claimed was the ex- so-called exclusionary language or was it just a vague statement? It was a vague statement and they never said which tweets. Okay. Um, it took about six months for me to lose my job. It was a slightly messy process. Okay. Um, but, oh, and so over that time they, they did an investigation and they looked at, I, I continued to tweet on the topic. And so they looked at the whole of my tweets, but they never said which ones were offensive. And, and mm-hmm. basically I think it was, you know, just the fact that I was saying, I don't agree that trans women are women. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that, you know, people can live their life. I mean, as, as JK Rowling said about me, you know, wear what you like, call yourself what you like, you know, live your best life. But yeah. um, we need to be able to talk about the two sexes where that matters. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so, so what happened next? So you received this sort of warning letter telling you that you need to put a disclaimer in your bio and you do that. And then what happens next? Um, so then uh, that was October 2018. Um, and so I continued to, I mean, I tweeted about other things, but I continued to tweet about this topic. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was in the process of um, uh developing a project with them. So we were applying for a grant. Uh, It had my name on the grant. It had my ideas in the project. And the idea was when we got the money, I would then get a sort of full-time contract. So the, which is why it sort of was, was slightly messy. So over that time, over the next six months, um, gradually that uh, offer of a contract was removed. And then the offer of, um, staying on as a as a consultant or as a visiting fellow was also removed so it was a sort of it was a gradual process and they investigated my tweets um they you know they just uh considered whether I could stay on in the organization and in the end decided decided no so that was March 2019 I uh lost my job by email and so I tweeted about that um, and I tweeted an article that I'd been writing about uh, sex and gender in international development organisations because you know, there are lots of different organisations that have to think about sex and gender. But, you know, this, the field I was working in was international development mm-hmm. where organisations are thinking about you know, maternal mortality and um, you know, early marriage or, you know, what what are the things that make women's lives and men's lives different? Yeah. Um, and to, to deny that sex is real, um, I thought was was crazy. So so I published the article, I tweeted, and what I didn't know was that there were uh, sort of feminist lawyers waiting for a test case. And I turned out to be a good test case. So um, we went to employment tribunal and mm. Um, it, it was like all of the bad Twitter arguments about this topic <laughs> played out in court. <laughs> I, I mean, clownfish and, you know, the, the whole the whole thing, bringing in intersex conditions, um, sort of saying, how can you possibly tell what sex someone is if you weren't there when they were assigned their sex at birth? It was, it was... It, you wow. know, it was, in a it court. was amazing in a in court, a court. Wow. in a court, um, you know, so obviously I thought we had the good arguments, um, mm. but the judge thought different. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, and what was the what was the court case? Was it about an unfair dismissal? Mm. Is that correct? So, oh. no. So it's a oh, no. discrimination case. And the, what it is, is that in 
the Equality Act, there are nine protected characteristics. So things that you can't be discriminated against for sex, race, disability, age, and so on. And there's a protected characteristic called belief, religion or belief. So you shouldn't be discriminated against for being a Muslim. You shouldn't be discriminated against for being Christian. You shouldn't also be discriminated against for being an atheist mm -hmm. or an ex-Muslim or, mm -hmm. you know, in any way in relation to religion, but also belief, meaning philosophical beliefs. Okay. And so they have a set of criteria for what counts as a philosophical belief. And in some ways, you know, it's, it seems crazy to say believing that your mother is female and your father is male is a, is a belief. Um, but this is the way, the way it sort of fits. Um, and it's a belief because it does affect your life to, you know, to believe that sex is real. And it doesn't have to be a belief that is purely, um, you know, the fact Religious that it's based on Yes, exactly. The fact that it's true doesn't stop it being a belief. But we had to prove that this was a belief that was coherent, serious, um, important to me in my life. And, it, and this fifth criteria, which is that it is worthy of respect in a democratic society. <laughs> and it doesn't undermine other people's human rights okay. and basically that's the idea that you know your beliefs are protected but if your belief is um you know uh, uh, nazism it uh, upsets a couple people on Twitter. Well, oh okay, okay well yeah, no yeah. it's supposed to be a very low bar to pass gotcha, so it's supposed gotcha. to be if you know if you're a nazi okay. if you are a holocaust denier um if you want to overthrow the government by violent um revolution those mm. are the kind of beliefs that aren't protected in the workplace but anything okay. else should be protected so the kinds of beliefs that protected are like ethical veganism mm. and mm. um scottish nationalism anything that people feel strongly about and is coherent it doesn't mean that other people have to have the belief or even respect it yeah. you know you just have the belief so this was what we had to prove was that the belief uh met these criteria and so I'm, I'm i'm struggling to believe we're even having it let alone I, yeah, I'm, this I whole know. Con, I, i'm like i feel like i'm living in a south park episode or something i'm just kind of like welcome to my like, life <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just like what even how i'm like how's this even a a conversation we're talking about a belief that like 99 percent plus of the world holds and is a fact yeah um yeah, but but carry on. It's it's just blowing yeah. my mind. As, and as and so and so the reason why we had to do it was because you know it's not just me that lost my job over this. There are hundreds, probably thousands of of mainly women, but you know also men, mm. um, who are facing disciplinary processes at work, or uh, you know being forced to apologize. Um, you know people being forced to put pronouns into their email uh, bios and to, you know, go on trainings and to declare that they believe this new religion that gender identity replaces sex. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it's not just me uh, that has to prove this crazy thing that this belief is, is worthy of respect. Um, it's worth doing because it um, protects a whole lot of people. Mm -hmm. um so yeah so that was so that so that was what the hearing was about and then if i succeed in showing that that belief is worthy of respect and meets all these characteristics then i still have to go back and show that i was discriminated against in work and you know how i lost my job and all of that mm -hmm. kind of thing that hasn't that hasn't been um shown in court yet the only thing that's been questioned is is this belief worthy of respect, is it protected by the Equality Act? And and it gets into freedom of speech and freedom of belief. Okay. And if I'm correct, the the judge decided that these views are, he made a statement saying that um, such views are not worthy of respect in a democratic society. So I, I've seen that, I've seen that sentence, I've seen that quote, um, but was there any more context to that? Um, so he said that my belief is absolutist and he said that um, although I could talk about 
I could campaign against gender self ID. I could campaign for uh, single sex sports and single sex services. I couldn't do it with the ordinary language of talking about men and women and male and female. So he said, you can, you can campaign, but you have to say women who are assigned male at birth and women who are assigned female at birth. This is, this is what he said. So he so said, he, he told you the language that you have yeah, to use. I mean, in the judgment, this is, this is wow. written down. So, so he said, I'm not taking away your freedom of speech because you can still campaign about these issues, but you have to do it with this tortured language and you know and these are these are everyday issues and they and in practice they affect children you know they affect elderly women they affect i mean men and women but you know people who speak More english as a second language you know i mean everyone needs to understand when they go into a space where they're going to take the clothes off is it single sex or mixed sex? Mm -hmm. uh, every, you know, everyone needs to know where they're going or a hospital ward or who's going to examine me. It's a, you know, basic consent. Yes. And people need to be able to talk about that with words, with ordinary words, not with, um, you know, not with women assigned male at birth, um, I think. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think the problem isn't just that you think, I think it's that you know. And I think that the most concerning thing about this, I mean, it's weird because on one side, obviously not you, or not you being dismissed from your job, but these type of conversations, in a way, they're hilarious because I'm just like, what on earth is this insane clown world yeah. that we've fallen into in the past few years where these type of conversations are even conversations and people are just believing and saying the most ludicrous things. I mean, just yesterday, I saw a woman tweeting about men having miscarriages, right? And I'm just like, you know, it's, it's, some men have miscarriages. And it's just like, on, on one hand, it's hilarious. Like, it makes me laugh because I'm just like, oh my gosh. But then, on another hand, it's it's terrifying, <laughs> right? On multiple aspects, right? Of course, the encroachment on freedom of speech and the concept of a view being held by 99% of people in the world, I, I'd literally estimate that 99% of people in the world globally hold that perspective, which is just a fact. And, you know, we all exist and we all know how we got here. So it's uh, as, as far as things which are just like factual and undeniable, it's 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 up there, right? It's yeah. up there with two plus two equals four, which now people are also debating. And the biggest concern for me, besides the governmental overreach and the infringement on the the right to speak is the assault on reality. That's the thing that freaks me out about this whole thing is if you can get and for, not just get some people to believe certain delusions and falsities, but you can punish people for not doing so. And you can try to like force people like that is what freaks me out because mm. it's just like, oh, my gosh, like, there's something I say, which is that you, you should never be you shouldn't be punished for telling the truth. Right. So stating a fact, stating a truth, stating a fact, stating a truth, stating a statistic, whatever it is, you know, living in a society where that is punished and you are incentivized to lie is incredibly dangerous, yes. incredibly dangerous. Uh, and there's a historical precedent on that. Absolutely. And I think, you know, you get something important there, which is, you know, 99 percent of people probably more believe yeah. this. So a large proportion of people who say who are willing to say trans women are women also don't believe in it it's yeah. not you know it's not a, a believers and non-believers it's the no. people who are willing to go along with it and the people who aren't mm -hmm. and i think you know it, it breaks societies and it breaks institutions like you say if if the people at the top are lying about this what else will they lie about um to you know to keep their jobs and their pensions mm. and you know if if um if you can't yeah if you can't talk about material reality and you can't collect statistics and you can't um call it out when your organization is is talking bullshit then you know the whole structure by which you're trying to um run organizations with integrity you know public sector organizations universities charities businesses big you know big organizations that run on rules if people are incentivized to lie. Mm. 
Yeah, it's, it's, it's very, it's very troubling. And what's really weird is how rapidly um, certain countries, it seems, it seems especially, I don't even want to just say the West, but it seems like Anglosphere countries in particular seem to have particularly fallen victim to this weird new um, neo-secular religion or ideology, this whole concept of gender theory. I know it goes along with some of the critical race theory and, you know, intersectionality. There's, there's a whole bunch of sort of beliefs that tend to get lumped together, what, what people kind of call woke, right? They tend to come as this whole package, certain views on gender, certain views on race, all of this stuff, which is very conflicting, hypocritical, very anti-science. I know, you know, and then those people would like to use the term anti-science, but just a lot of nonsensical beliefs. It's, um, you know, a very 1984-esque Orwellian newspeak. I mean, what that judge, what you said he was saying that you're meant to say, like a woman who was identified. Yeah. I mean, that's literally like something out of 1984. Yeah. That, that is yeah. so Orwellian. Yeah. I mean, 1984, you know, it's not supposed to be a, a user's handbook. <laughs> it's yeah. It's supposed to be a warning. And it's that, you know, there are so many things from, from 1984 that I think are, you know, playing out in, in organizations. Mm. How do you think we got here? Um, I think, I think we got here because our institutions were vulnerable. I think, you know, we have this set of enlightenment institutions, the civil service, universities, um, the mainstream media that have a business model you know, you need to have a business model to keep the lights on and they have a mythology and you need to have a mythology to motivate people and to tell people what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And none of, neither of those are perfect. The, you know, the mythology is never exactly true. You know, the mythology that all professors sorry, are. I think, oh, I, think sorry. Mic is, I think your mic oh. is rubbing against something. Oh, sorry. Is that, yeah, is that better? Okay. Yeah, well, um, I think it was just rubbing against you. Okay. okay. Um, you know, the mythology that professors are all working for, um, you know, the greater good of knowledge rather than for their career or for, um, you know, their sex appeal or all of the sort of baser things that also motivate people, um, you know, isn't part of the mythology of institutions. So the mythology of an institution is, you know, we know it's not exactly true, but it works to us you know it works to a certain extent and it motivates the things that we get out of institutions that are good that they you know that they advance knowledge that they advance wealth um that they um set rules and stick to them and they do that because they've got a business model that works that they can attract resources and then you have the people in those organizations who are fighting over those resources and i think you know on one hand you have all of the business models of our big enlightenment institutions are being hollowed out by the internet. Um, and on the other hand, you have uh, ideologies that are um, that have sort of taken some of the bits of the mythology and run with it to um, you know to the nth degree. So the idea of equality, mm -hmm. which is a good thing, has you know, was then taken to the point of, well, in order to have equality between men and women, you have to say there are no such thing as men and women or that sex is sex is not real. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, you have these kind of runaway mythologies and then you have organisate, you know, then you have the business models that are not working and then you have the people in those organisations who remain, you know, highly evolved apes <laughs> <laughs> living on a rock, trying to, you know, um, cop off with each other and look after their own, look after their children, um, you know, get resources, get status, all the things that human beings have always done mm. and telling a mythology that doesn't work. And I think it's those three things that have kind of run away from us. Yeah. I wonder if it's, um, it seems like a, how would I, what would be the best way to put it? It seems like a, um, almost like a weakness, a weakness of liberalism in a way. Yeah. Like, right. I, like, like liberal. I think, you know, living in a country like the U, U, UK, USA, Canada, et cetera, 
these are societies which we sort of call liberal, not in the hard political sense, but in the in the in the true sense, right? Liberal isn't, you know, free. People can have different ideas. You're supposed to have freedom of speech and, you know, people can believe or not believe what they want, et cetera. You've got all kinds of different people together in one place and so on and so forth. Um, but this ideology and all all of the sort of woke package, it seems like um a a, a society that's too, may perhaps too liberal in a sense is then very much open to assault and takeover from something which is less liberal and less tolerant and yeah. more more dogmatic right because with so many of these things the truth is with a lot of these ideas in a country that's more i'm saying this is someone who's you know got nigerian background and who grew up in saudi arabia right like in a country that's more conservative like they they, they won't even entertain some of these ideas right <laughs> Yeah. Right. It, it's not going to be like, oh yeah, like let's let's have a whole conversation. Oh, tell me about this. Let's have a whole conversation. It's it's just like get out of here. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, what well, are you talking about? Men are men, women are women. But I think here it's kind of like, oh, okay, let's let's discuss all of this, and then it, it goes from a discussion to, oh, actually, maybe this is you know, these got this postmodern thinkers, and it's like, oh, actually, maybe uh, you know, the male and the maybe these are social constructs, and then you detach. I mean, when I was growing up, sex and gender always meant the same thing. Right. And now it's like, oh, no, you're talking, you know, the fact people it was interesting, you know, you were saying even sex and gender. And it's like, wow, my whole life, sex and gender are always the same thing. And now people are detaching them, de decoupling yeah. them. And once you do that, you can then play all these weird games where, you know, you're saying that man and ma man and male are now separate and woman and female are now separate. And then they're fluid. And but also you can be born in the wrong body. Which also doesn't make sense because if sex isn't real, how can people? None of none of it makes sense. No. It's like this double think, triple think thing that's going on. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, you ask how we got here, and I mean, that was the sort of big picture answer. But I think mm. you know, a sort of small picture answer is using gender. You know, gender was used because people didn't want to say sex because mm. sex, you know, is rude. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so you know, so people said gender because it sounded clever. And it sounded polite, but nobody knew, you know, it was just a synonym for sex. Yeah. And then social scientists said, well, gender is the social construct. Gender mm -hmm. is, you know, everything else that's associated with being male and female. And then those two things can be separate. Um, so I try, I, I don't think gender is a useful, I think it's too dangerous a word at this point because sure. um, it's a kind of bait and switch. You, you, you try and tie it down to mean something and someone else will mean it will take it to mean something else mm -hmm. so sorry i'm I, getting the, the mic thing again oh sorry. sorry so so i just think we should talk about sex because that's mm -hmm. clear um and then you know gender if, if somebody wants to declare a gender if they want to declare um you know a religion if they want to declare a football team there are all kinds of things that are important to people's identity but mm. they're not the same as their sex and yeah. their sex can't change it's um so it's, yeah so i so i, I know i know <laughs> I'm, right? I'm, I'm joking I'm, <laughs> I'm like to me it's, it's literally like the least <laughs> controversial, controversial statement in the world but we're just living in well, such a you know in, time. In, i mean you look at sort of all sorts of government policies and government systems and you see you know, this word gender is put in instead of sex. Mm -hmm. And then at the time it's put in, nobody thinks that it means anything different from sex. Yeah. But then, you know, a couple of years down the line, they're saying, oh, yeah, that's that's different. You can be non-binary or, mm -hmm. you know, somebody with a male body can um, examine a woman who's been raped and who's, you know, having a forensic examination. So suddenly the word gender has become, as you say, disassociated from from reality so yeah. yeah i don't i don't think it's a useful word at this point no i i think the whole thing is very very insidious i mean there are a lot of people who i think most people have this view of oh this has good intentions i don't buy that i don't i don't buy it at all from, from early i've thought this thing is very it's very insidious and i think there are perhaps some, you know, useful idiots who parrot and promote certain things who who they themselves have good intentions. But I think from the the sort of top level, I mean, because you're talking about governmental policies, it's like, 
what and and the the speed at which it's all happening and the sort of timing and the fact that it's, it's not just in the UK it's in Canada it's in the USA it's in all these English speaking Western countries all at the same time and I I don't give much sort of positive credit in the notion of oh this is really genuinely about making people uh, comfortable or or happy or or, or whatever I I don't. I just don't buy that. Like, I don't buy it. And I've seen so much evidence mm. counter to that. There's so much evidence counter to that, right? I mean, someone like yourself going through what you're going through and other, as you've said, it's it's interesting because this is just like, you know, women are being thrown under the bus. Let's keep it real, right? Women are being half the population, whether you're talking about sports or you're talking about, um, you know, a lot of these things, the truth is, you know, the effect, it's a very disproportionate effect, very disproportionate yeah. effect, right? And it's weird to me because I'm like, I often say this is the real patriarchy, right? So, you know, you'll have feminists talking about the patriarchy, patriarchy, and all. Someone like myself will be like, what are you talking about? Like living in the, in the UK, USA, there's no patriarchy, whatever. But then like this particular issue, I'm like, oh no, this is the <laughs> patriarchy. Like this is, this is having men just be able to, literally just by by just you can you can just say you're a woman or you're part of this movement or whatever and suddenly you've got complete license to be very misogynistic to call people horrible names to threaten people to be violent towards people to do all of these awful things which i think like if a man who's not wearing a dress or lipstick or whatever or you know were to do you'd be like whoa this guy's like super misogynistic super sexist you've got this whole turf label and you know people making violent threats like all of this awful stuff you're getting seen women getting kicked off social media um you know i've had on my podcast i've had um uh, posey parker i've had on megan megan murphy and it's very much whoa like women are getting like women are getting like screwed over here right and and a lot of it also is coming from some of it also comes from other women which the whole thing's just really bizarre to me it's like it, it's something that should be such a fringe issue and i think to most people it still is because i think most people don't get i don't think most people understand the implications of all this right? yeah some, I think, you know i think that's right if, you know if you're not on social media i think you know you probably don't see it until um you know until you're in a situation that you can't control yeah. like you know a hospital ward or your child's at school and what's your child getting taught um you know that those kinds of situations um but yeah, I think, I, I mean, I think you're right for any sort of understanding of the world, you need to be able to do pattern recognition. You know, mm -hmm. you need to be able to say what you see and you need to be able to, you know, as you say, just because a guy is, you know, changes their pronouns or wears lipstick, it doesn't change the underlying behavior if what they're doing is bullying women or attacking women. And if you can't name that, if you can't name male violence, you know, if you're reporting um, rapists as being female in, you know, in government statistics, you can't, um, you know, you can't name what's happening. And, you know, I think that's, I think that's true at every, every level from these, mm. these kind of small interactions to the kind of big government systems, you have to be able to risk assess, you have to be able to say, who is male and who is female yeah. um and and as you say that there's this question about is this good intentioned or not i think there are there are a group of people who are good intentioned mm -hmm. there are a group of people who are scared i think i think that's a majority i think people are just i think ones. i think that's i think you're right yeah. and then i think there is a group of people who will exploit this because if you do anything that says there is a group of men who are above reproach, mm -hmm. who don't need risk assessment, who don't need the, who are outside of the normal safeguards, there will be people who will be attracted to that, yep. to, to exploit it. You know, we've been here before. We used to say this about priests. We used to say this about scout leaders. You know, there were, whole, there were groups of men who were seen as above reproach. And we've been through so many cycles of, learning lessons about these things and building safeguarding systems and then you know as soon as they're built people turn around and go oh you know now you change the words we, we can't see yeah. the risk anymore yeah. um 
And, you know, I think as soon as you do that, there will be people who exploit that and who are doing that with, with bad intentions. But I think, mm. you know, the majority are frightened. And the majority um, are frightened. You know, I think, um, and I think, you know, you get that when you have private conversations with people as well. I think also what's interesting about this topic is I think it breeds it breeds contempt and division across the board, right? When you're trying to, I mean, you know, I mean, there aren't tons of trans people in the world, but I know, and I'm connected to more trans people than the average person is. I think the average person is connected to zero. And with the size of my social media or whatever, you know, I've, you know, I've got do- dozens at this stage that I've chatted to and whatever. And I don't know a single one of them who, for example, with the whole like, um, you know, men, you know, trans women in sport thing or men identifying to as women to compete in sports. I don't know. A, maybe I guess I probably know the ones who are more the sane, more rational but, ones. Yeah, yeah. But, but not a single one of them thinks that is reasonable or a good idea because they they under they 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 recognize they still recognize objective reality and they're like no that's silly that's not fair and i think it also breeds contempt for people who are trans or who genuinely have g- gender dysphoria or whatever right because that's what like if most people don't know anyone who actually is in that situation or you know identifies as a different gender or whatever then they're just seeing the ma- they're just seeing the crazy stuff, right? They're, this this stuff. This is what they're they're seeing and what they're hearing, and they're just like, oh my gosh, like these people are just crazy. Like, what what on earth is this? That's what that's what they think of. So, I think it's just bad for. I just think it's bad for everyone. It's like it's. I think it's bad for the people who it's claiming that it's supposed to be helping because you're going to have the other ninety nine point nine percent of the population who's like, wait, like what? No, this isn't cool. Um, once they actually catch wind and maybe once it affects, starts affecting them, because people tend to not care about things until it affects them. Um, you know, when what happened to you starts happening to, oh, oh, that happened to you now. So now, yeah. now you said it, right? You know, when people's daughters start losing sports scholarships or they start getting injured because they're playing against boys in rugby, right? They're playing against a 16 year old boy and getting battered in fit contact sports, et cetera. That's when people will really care. And I don't know. It's, um, it's, it's all very, very, peculiar to me it's it's it doesn't it, it doesn't feel real sometimes it's uh you know yeah I don't know. <laughs> yeah i mean you know it has sort of preoccupied me obviously since since i lost my job that was um you know an injustice that was done to me but also you know when i tell this story like i can hear it's mad it you know <laughs> that, yeah it doesn't make sense like yeah. If if you if you told this story, it's a bit like my deadlift tweet. If you told this story to most people in the world, if you travel to like parts of Asia, Africa, South America, and, and you just ex- told them the story, they just sort of be looking at you confused. Yeah, like like it would they wouldn't even have the context, right? They'd just be like, "Huh, I don't, I yeah. don't get it," you know. And and I think that means that you know big organizations that deal with um, the public. That they are writing these policies at a high level and they're not able to put them into practice because you can't, um, you know, you can't educate grandmas who've known all their life that men are men and women are women to use mm. different language or, you know, the World Bank, the UN, these international development organizations in their headquarters, they're all adopting these crazy policies, yep. but on the ground, they understand who's a man and who's a woman and so then you're you're getting this disjunction between what organizations say and what the staff do Mm -hmm. and then that you know that puts people in a difficult position um because they're you know that they're not able to um they have these policies they can't they can't use um and like you say you'll never get the average person on the street i think to say you know that somebody with a male body can be in a women's shower or women's changing room it's it's not right no um, it, it, it's so absurd and also i mean it, it firstly this goes beyond humans right like every every <laughs> species every sexually dimorphic species and sexually reproducing species you've got males and you've got females and they create babies by 
you know, <laughs> as, as we know. And so it's and then even if you're like talking to children, even babies can see and recognize the difference between a man and a woman, a boy and a girl. You don't you don't even need to explain it to them. It's just itself. It's so self-evident. You walk down the street, you know, immediately man, man, woman, man, man, woman, woman, like you don't even you don't think about it. Yes, sure. If someone goes through a whole process or, you know, they dress a certain way, there might be someone who's like, "Ooh, okay, not sure there. But it's so strange how over 99 percent of people are supposed to just totally we're just supposed to disrupt the whole English language, Mm -hmm. disrupt science, disrupt biology, just change everything, everything we believe for the past several millennia um to accommodate i don't even i mean i don't even know what the percentage is to to accommodate like a couple of strange people on on twitter and people who have this ideology from universities or or whatever it is it's the most it's the most bizarre thing to me i i I don't know i i feel like the time period we're living in now people are either going to look back and be like what were they doing there that was kind of crazy like what was up with that or they'll be like, that's when it started. All right. I, I don't know. I don't I don't know which one is gonna be. Yeah. I mean, I, I think this issue is like, I mean, as you say, there are other issues though, the way people think about race, that you know, there's all kinds of other issues mm. that people are starting to think about in in crazy ways. But this one is particularly crazy because of how um fundamental sex is, right? Mm. Worms do it, plants do it. And <laughs> And because, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, I mean, it's like a canary in the coal mine kind of issue for how robust are our institutions Mm -hmm. to sort of craziness and, you know, to to cult-like behaviour and to capture by a small group of people who, you know, and I don't mean a small group of trans people, I mean a small group of people who claim to be acting on on the behalf of trans mm-hmm. people, but who are um, capturing capturing organisations. And so I think sort of if we can solve this one, it can also maybe be a template for how we think about other sort of irrational um, group think that take over institutions. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, I can't... I I do think in the fu- at some point in the future we'll look back and go, yeah, wasn't that crazy that time when we thought this was <laughs> controversial? Moment, moment of madness. Because, yeah. yeah, because you know women are still going to have babies. Yeah. That you know everybody has a mother. Um, that's not going away, and uh, you know so I do think this is this has got to be a moment of madness. But at the mm-hmm. same time, it's so ingrained in all our institutions in in the west you know it's ingrained in the guidance that schools get it's ingrained in what judges are told to do so the reason for my judgment was because my because judges are trained to use this language Mm. um and so all of that needs to be unpicked who are are the people in these institutions who are who are driving all this because it's so coordinated so there must be people with this ideology who want to ram it down on the population Mm. who are in very high seats of power i think quite often when you you look in institutions there's kind of one or two people who have got into them um Mm. and who have driven the agenda and then i think you have a lot of uh confused civil servants or sort of confused middle managers who get the fear and who don't want to um you know every it's not like any of this is hard right it's it's not rocket science but in order to in order to, to talk rationally about it you you know you face that um those attacks and so you, all of those people that sort of have the fear then say well let's get an external organization in you know there's that thing of like nobody lost their job for hiring out you know for buying ibm so mm-hmm. people go well nobody lost their job for getting in stonewall and then they get in stonewall to advise them and all of the so almost all government departments, NHS bodies, schools, universities are signed up to um, the Stonewall Champion Scheme. So they they pay Stonewall 
to set standard for them and to audit them against the standard and to give them like a badge, you know, you, you're a diversity champion at the end of the year. So these are, these are government departments saying, mm -hmm. we can't understand the law. Give us a, you know, give us a different law. Give us Stonewall law. We'll do what you say. We'll make ourselves accountable to this private organization to tell us what to do. And they say they cover 25% of the UK workforce. And that's wow. of, and that of that twenty five percent, that's government departments, big companies. Mm -hmm. So it's not you know, car mechanics and people selling fruit and veg. It's the people who are making decisions that affect other people's lives mm -hmm. who are covered by that. So I think that's that's a large part of how this has become so embedded. Yeah. And you know, you have conversations with ordinary people and they all go this is crazy but you have conversations with people who have careers that depend on these pathways mm -hmm. and they go oh, it's too hot i can't talk about it or i'm busy or we can't talk about this on twitter yeah zuby just <laughs> became a little bit more libertarian um <laughs> <laughs> well, you know big organizations of all sorts are yeah. are uh, vulnerable to it's this true. i mean that is true yeah because it's happening it affects the private sector as well yeah yeah um, it's, a, it's a it's a weird one it's a very yeah. very weird one but you've started your own organization right sex yes. Matters. so tell us a little bit about that so sex matters is a single issue campaign to re-establish clarity about sex in law policy and culture so it is um to unpick stonewall law to unpick uh this adoption of gender identity instead of sex across so our when institutions. You, when you say stonewall law, I, I can't, so. <laughs> it, 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 no, I, I, I can't, I can't, um, I, I can't help, but it, it sounds like a parallel to like Sharia law. Yeah. Well, when I think, that's, law, yeah, it's like I think a parallel that's, legal it is, system. that's, it's, that's exactly what it is. Mm. That's exactly what it is. I think, you know, institutions that are, have adopted stonewall law and they're holding their staff to it um, instead of, instead of letting them use the law um and so what we want to do is challenge that in parliament uh in institutions help people speak up give people tools that they need in terms of saying no you know the law does still say that men are male and women are female and that you can talk about that and you have freedom of speech and freedom of belief um so it's not that we have to completely reinvent this stuff but we just have to get back to to some kind of sanity i got you where does most of the support come from and where does most of the opposition come from um so most of the support for all of there's so my case is one of um about a dozen cases that are testing sort of gender critical ideas in court so cases okay. like kira bell which was about a young woman who detransitioned, mm -hmm. um, other employment cases. There's a woman who was um, thrown out from being a girl guide leader for saying that, you know, uh, males who identify as women are not women. Um, and so overall, over the last two years, um, about a million pounds has been raised by the crowd funders for, for these cases. Mm -hmm. And they came from largely from women largely from anonymous women who are they you know people can put 20 pounds or 30 pounds in a crowdfunder as a way of doing something without putting yourself at risk mm. um so this has been like grassroots um as i say kind of mainly women a lot of feminists but also a lot of people who are motivated by freedom of speech freedom yes. of belief or just material reality uh, child safeguarding um so that's the the sort of core of who supported this but as you say this is something that 99 percent of people believe in yeah. and um everyone has to deal with institutions so we need our institutions to to get back to back to reality 100 percent. I, I think everybody just needs more backbone i feel this on so many so 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 many issues it, it's not just this one thing but people just it's like i don't know if all the toughness got lost in world war ii or something like that but like i don't know just uk usa canada australia new zealand these countries in particular it's just like 
people have just lost their lost their spines um yeah and it it it, it saddens me right it, it does it does upset me because i'm just like look we're not even talking about something here that's like ooh, this is super really sort of out there and edgy and controversial i'm just like yo like this this is such a a, a basic thing right it, you you shouldn't need to be some sort of hero the bar for being a hero shouldn't be the willingness to talk about objective facts and yeah. reality which which we all know and another thing that's really interesting is when you have people who sort of believe in this whole gender theory and redefinition of it whatever um i mean with just a few basic questions they can't answer basic questions you no know? and so what? that's why you have to be punished you have to lose your job yeah, you have you know it's because... crazy to me it's just you know it's okay what is a man and they give some weird circular answer what is a woman they, they can't define these terms or even yeah. if you just ask them because i know all these people i'm like look none of you believed this 15 years ago probably even 10 years ago right in 2011 you didn't believe that there and, were and none of you believe it so. when you're in bed i mean none no. of you believe it when it comes to you reality, know just to, reality yeah and and sex you yeah. know there are some there are some bottom lines where people go yeah okay i understand what mm. a man is and what a woman is yeah, it, it's it's so odd because I've asked that question to people. I'm like, okay, you know, they're telling me all their theories. And I'm like, okay, when did you start believing that? And they're like, oh, well, you know, this the science, is, the science has changed. I'm like, what science has changed? Like, tell me, you know, like what what has changed? You Ten years ago, you believed that there were two genders, male, female, and you, you can't actually, sure, people can get sex changes or do hormones or whatever, but, you know, your, your chromosomes, et cetera. You know, a man's a man's a woman's a woman. We get it. Um, and then the whole thing with sports, because you would think the sports one is such an ob. Again, it's so obvious. It's so obvious when you're having people saying that there's no, there's no strength differential. Yeah, <laughs> think, I'm just like, what? You know, you're lying. Like you know that. Yeah, but I think people are talking from their incentives. So mm. I think you know the the big thing in the UK and probably in most places is house prices and mortgages. You know, if you have a mortgage that you have to pay yeah. then that's going to motivate you and in the US it's um health insurance you know if you're mm. if you lose your employer and lose your health insurance you, you could be dead yeah uh, so those things are those things are motivating and so for the people who are promoting this you know people in universities who in the gender studies departments or whatever whose salary depends on this they will believe it and mm. the people whose salary depends on not challenging it will go along with it um that, you know i think kind of cognitive dissonance of people trying to reconcile what they need to do to you know to to make a living mm -hmm. and their conception of themselves as a good and rational person is what then clouds all of this stuff which you know if you just look at it with a, even a five-year-old's eyes or you know just <laughs> with your eyes open for you know for a few minutes Mm. and have a rational discussion you know you can see that there's there's nothing there um yeah. but but because it's so embedded in organizations people go along with it and as you say a lot of people are cowards yeah do you, do you know what i honestly think is the would be the quickest solution to all this is everyone doing what i did <laughs> right every everyone like men women just everyone just start just start identifying as whatever you want. Just just play the game. Yeah. Play, get, okay, I those mean, are the rules. Cool. Like let's. Yeah. Do I mean, I thought yeah. if they brought in gender self ID, I would be a man because yeah. you know you can be a man and have be pregnant. What what is just, it that yeah. it involves? Yeah, um, I think I think I think I think it's hard to. I think it's impossible to use ration rationale and logic to get out of to get someone out of a position that they reached purely through emotion. Right. I think you have to, I think, you know, these people, the people who are really into this, they don't get logic and ration. So it's no. like, okay, I'm just going to, I'm just going to take what you're saying at face value and let's roll with it. Right. Let's just roll with it. Especially now that you're able to even identify as different races, right? They're now, you know, doing events and, you know, if you identify as black or you identify as indigenous yeah. or what. So I'm just like, okay, cool. I am a, I'm a, I'm a white woman right now. Like straight up. Cool. Yeah. I'm a white woman. I want you to refer to me as you know, just, just play the game, right? Say, okay, these are my pronouns. 
well, just, you know, yeah, I don't know. In, in, my, in my tribunal, my, my lawyer asked if, if Maya identifies as, as Chinese, mm. is she Chinese? And the HR, head of HR said yes. <laughs> Well, there we go. This <laughs> yeah, is what I mean. Yeah. Right? Change, change your age, change it. Just, I think if everyone just played this game yeah. and it was just, oh, you know what? Even with the women's sports thing, right? I think um, to fix that, I think loads of men need to just identify as women and just, 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 just blow the whole thing up. Yeah, just, and, just and, blow and the whole not, thing up. And not just in sports. You know, they need yeah. to do it in the women's book uh, prize. Mm-hmm. They need to do it in politics. You know, but. Yeah. You know, you Donald, sort of say Donald that. Donald Trump missed a big, big yeah. move there. I was but saying that would have of, been the best troll ever. Yeah, although you say <laughs> that and then it happens and people just go, oh, okay, that's fine. You know, mm-hmm. so you have a male women's officer in the Green Party that's an elected, <laughs> you know, the, the, the co-convener of the women's group in the, in the Green Party yeah. is male mm-hmm. and people nod along so every anything we, you we can make more. up we need more i'm sure your deadlift thing will you know somebody will do it in all seriousness and people yeah. go yeah it has to it, that's why it has to be a mass movement it can't it can't <laughs> just be one or two people because then they're like okay if, if, if anything that solidifies it if it's just a couple people. yeah but if it's just like okay loads of like men just need to just raid the women's locker room and just say hey, you know someone has a problem hey we're all, we identify as women you know just 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 show the absurdity of it. Just, just, just play the game. Yeah. And but you then know. I think the problem is organize <laughs> where you need to have single sex spaces because mm. organizations realize they can't um, put these rules into practice. Then they just go, okay, we'll get rid of them. We won't have any single sex spaces because they can never decide which males have the right to be there. Mm-hmm. So then they go, well, it's just too difficult. We won't do it at all. And then it's women who who suffer yeah it's a weird one it's a very very weird one but um i know you've got your appeal coming up so i wish you i wish you all the best with that um, thank you um and- we'll be live tweeting it on tuesday and when, well i won't be because i'll be okay. sitting there but I'll, on sex matters org on twitter we'll be live tweeting uh everything from the tribunal awesome and where can people find you online maya um, I'm on Twitter, M4 Stata, and Sex Matters is sex matters.org. Awesome. Not hyphen, Maya. little line, whatever <laughs> it's called. Awesome, Maya. It's been great to have you on the show. Really, really good to talk. And yeah, we'll uh, let's see where the world goes, eh? But hopefully yes. things will yeah. start to turn soon. Get, get some more world records. <laughs> really nice to talk to you. Put some respect on my name. Sick like a rain, click like a rain.